My name is Jeanette Wallace and I am with a Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen out of Seattle, Washington. I've been working for BNSF Railway since uh, 2004. November of 2008 um, was when this incident happened. I had been working with a, a number of hostlers, and these are people who operate locomotives. They have the card to operate locomotives, but not with cars attached. So when you see four or five cars at the beginning of the train, we're the ones that put them together and test them. And uh, the company was having a hard time finding people to fill these positions because it's the lowest paying position on the railroad. So they were getting people right out of class. Sometimes they were forcing them, sometimes they were just allowing them to mark to these jobs. It used to be you needed at least a year training before you could operate a locomotive. These people were 12 weeks out of class and um, I had been complaining to management about it, saying that these people weren't trained, that it was stressful to me having to do two jobs. <laughs> Uh, so it was stressful to me having to work basically to the jobs of two people. And I told them specifically two weeks prior to my accident that somebody was going to get hurt. And what happened was I was working with someone who, uh, again, I felt had inadequate training. And we were shoving on a track around a, a curve. And I was giving hand signs, telling her to how many cars until we had to stop. Um, she lost sight of me. Um, had changed the channel, I checked the channel for the radio, you know, as a kind of a fail-safe second method, and uh, she had changed it without telling me. So I'm telling her to stop, I'm waving, and, and she didn't stop. And we hit at about eight miles an hour, the locomotive hit. I jumped off right before the, the impact and uh, snapped my ACL. And um, the Where's your ACL? That's the, the knee, okay. the ligament that holds your kneecap, basically. And um, the first thought, because I, this has been common knowledge on the railroad for a long time, if you get injured, you have a mark on your back. You're going to be fired. You're going to be disciplined. And that was the first thing I thought of was, oh, my God, I'm going to lose my job. And sure enough, management came out, um, called an ambulance for me. I, um, I was in shock. I was in pain. <laughs> I was scared. Um, went to the hospital. Management followed me behind the ambulance to the hospital. And uh, when I got into the examination room, I told everybody that came in the room that I was not under L and I, we're under a different, um, the Federal Employee Liability Act. So the company doesn't have any access to our medical information without our consent. And I told them specifically. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they had been attempting to come into the room. They had been asking several times to come into the room to talk to me, and um, which they denied later. but. But uh, security finally came and said, you know, what do you want me to do? And I said, I want you to tell them to leave. So they left. And um, within uh, the next day, I got a lawyer, which you have to do um, under FILA. And uh, they, they called an investigation, as they always do. They determined that I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't cause the accident. Somebody else did. And uh, the person that caused the accident basically got no discipline whatsoever, even because they violated like four of our, what they call deadly decisions, no discipline. But I went to investigation and I was disciplined for conduct. So they felt like I was withholding information by kicking management out of the ER, which was my right, you know, under every law, really. So um, I didn't go to my investigation, actually. I had federal court protection um, because the railroad has been known to do this. They have this investigation. You're not allowed to have your attorney there. They get all this information out of you and uh, you lose your claim, the injury claim. So I got protection from that. They still found me guilty, gave me, um, gave me 40 points, which is uh, you, if you accrue so many points in your career, you know, in a certain period of time, you're terminated. So if you, um, if you go over a derail, if you corner some cars, if you, you know, anything like that, that's like five points. If you turn in an injury form, that's 40 points. Whether it's your fault or not, and it wasn't my fault, I got 40 points. On my record, I got a uh, level S, which is a, considered a serious violation for <laughs> my conduct, and uh, was on a year's probation. And um, in 2008, we were, we allowed to finally file these whistleblower claims against the railroads. That's the first time we've been able to do it as an industry, and I was one of the first people to file one of these cases. And um, <clears throat> OSHA did an investigation, which lasted about a year and a half. 
um, found in my favor. And at that point, your investigation goes to Washington, D.C. The Department of Labor has to oversee it. That was another year. So almost uh, two and a half years later, they finally came out with their findings in a flurry of press releases. You know, Wallace gets 340000 um, for retaliation by BNSF for reporting an injury. It sounded great, right? Well, as we've all found out now, we're, we're kind of the pioneers in this, um, all of the companies, all of the carriers are appealing these OSHA decisions. So they have 30 days, they appealed it on the 30th day, and, um, <clears throat> and then it goes to a de novo trial. So everything, all that two and a half years of investigation by OSHA is gone, like it never happened. The award, gone, like it never happened. And we had to go before a jury, who, uh, not a jury of my peers, mind you, <laughs> you know, nobody from the railroad industry who understood the history and, and, and understands the law, really. Um, the trial went on for 10 days. We were allowed to present very, very little information in terms of what actually happened to me. We were not allowed to say that BNSF lied to the Federal Railroad Administration and caused, they said that I caused my own injury by sneezing. We couldn't present that in the trial. You know, it was a very unfair uh, process that, that you have to go through. Um, and at the end of this, the jury deliberated for about 20 hours, and they found that BNSF did, in fact, violate the law. They found in my favor on that. Um, I was not able to get any of the, the pay that I missed out on. For a year and a half, I was out of work. Um, the, the lawyers convinced the jury that I got compensated for that uh, in my injury case, which I didn't, uh, but I couldn't say that again <laughs> in court. And they found that BNSF did not act maliciously somehow in violating federal law against me, and I was awarded 20000 in pain and suffering from the original 340000 which I probably won't see a penny of because apparently I'm also responsible for all these court fees if I win. So uh, I have until... Um, Monday, I, I find out if the railroad's going to appeal, at which point it would go to the Ninth Circuit. What, Monday, what day? Uh, so that's going to be, what is today? Fourth, or the fifth. April 5th, so April 7th. April 7th, 2014. Yes. For yes. an incident that began on? November 16th, 2008. And now this is just another step in this process, right? So then it would go to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and I believe that they're only able to see what was the very little we were able to present in this trial, and also not the original OSHA investigation. At that point, it would go, if they appeal that, it would go to the Supreme Court, who may or may not decide to hear the case. If they don't decide to hear it, it's gone. And I get nothing, and that, you know, that's probably 10 years of my life. So the, the whole system is rigged against workers. You know, we, we're not gonna win anything. This whole system is, you know, for lawyers to get paid, <laughs> lawyers make a lot of money off of us, whether they win or lose. Um, and it, it's all so, it's political, you know, every, every aspect of this. And um, so I think what I've learned through all of this is that the only way that we're really going to make change happen is to act collectively, it, that it's not going to be just Jen Wallace versus BNSF. It's going to be like all of the railroaders who have gone through this. There's been over a thousand railroaders since 2008 who filed these whistleblower claims. We're not talking to each other. We're not talking to our unions and telling our unions, this is a, a problem, a huge problem, and you need to step in and start organizing around it. That has not happened in my industry, unfortunately. Um, the UTU, um, SMART, actually, they merged with the sheet metal workers. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Um, they have at least been you know, telling these stories, putting the stories in, you know, of us who won um, in their newsletters, but my own union um, really denies that there's even a problem. What union is that? And that's the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. And who are they connected to? Uh, the Teamsters. So we affiliated with the Teamsters right before the conductors union affiliated with the sheet metal workers, you know, which one is AFL-CIO, the other is Change to Win, so they're fighting each other more than they're fighting the company. So what do the Teamsters say when you say that this is an important issue for all the workers, the health and safety in the public, and, and they need to take it up? Um, 
we have not really had much access to. I know that our general, one of our general chairmen, um, around the time that that we were able to get this Railroad Safety Act in place in 2007, 2008, was willing to speak on behalf of BNSF and say that that there's no retaliation against workers who report injury. And this was our union general chairman. Um, so, <laughs> at the international level. Um, it's it's as if the problem doesn't exist on the local level. They're so busy with all of these investigations and discipline and you know outright contract violations that you know happening every day. You know contracts that we've had for a hundred years are now just gone with a letter from the company saying yeah, we're not going to do this anymore. So they're kind of busy, <laughs> and we don't have any full time organizers. Um, these are all people that have to work full time jobs, and they do a great job, but. But it's it's overwhelming, and and really, I I don't want to depend on officers. Like th this is something that needs to be taken up by the rank and file, and uh, so that's what I hope to do. I haven't been able to talk about any of this for almost six years. So one benefit of winning <laughs> finally in federal court is I get to talk about it. And I think there's just me and one other guy um, who have won against class one railroads at this point. A systemic <clears throat> problem. I mean, it seems like there's intimidation and uh, retaliation against workers who raise serious health and safety concerns. Yeah. How are the, I mean, there are accidents on railroads, uh, there's cutting back of staff. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's a very dangerous explosive situation, which is not only dangerous to the workers, but also to the public. Yeah, hugely. And, and there have been a number of people in, in my area, my Northwest Division, who have been fired for filing safety complaints um, repeatedly. And, and, and I'm one of those people, I, I have no problem filing a safety complaint. And um, a lot of times they're ignored, um, but sometimes people do face retaliation because you know the, the more that we report to you know, the, the Federal Railroad Administration, the more scrutiny our terminal has. And uh, they don't want that. They don't want the, the feds coming in and, and looking at, at our equipment, you know, which, you know, we're woefully inadequately <laughs> understaffed and we but cannot these, hire these enough companies people. companies are billions of dollars, they're making billions of dollars in profit. <laughs> yeah. How much profit does this company make? Uh, well, we had to do a, a, an assessment of the financial health of BNSF, you know, in our, our jury, which I wasn't able to do because the, the jury didn't find that punitive damages were necessary <laughs> because they, they were going to just change the problem on their own. But um, $4 billion, I believe, was the last quarter profit. Have any executives been prosecuted criminally for <laughs> retaliating against uh, whistleblowers who are on health and safety? No, no. And I think that that's, that's a strategy that we need to take up as workers, that we're not just going after the carriers that it's these managers, you know, that are making the decisions. And sometimes they're making the decisions because they get it from higher up. I mean, we were able to uncover like many, many emails that all of my discipline came from corporate headquarters. The whole strategy of how I was gonna be treated, um, the whole strategy of not allowing me to come back to work for six months after I was released from my doctor, that all came from corporate. And that's something that is now a matter of public record, and um, but it happens all the time to me, and and worse things. I mean, I I wasn't fired. I was able to maintain my job probably because of this litigation. There was some protection there, but there are people who are killed, and and the same thing happens. You know, the 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 instant reaction from the carriers, and not just the railroad, but all industries, is how are we going to blame the worker? What violation of a rule can we find that we can pin on this person that? to make them responsible for their own death. This happens all the time. And, uh, and then something that's, that's in place that um, I just attended a workshop from uh, Nancy Lesson and um, she studies behavior-based safety programs and they've been doing it since the 30s. You know, these companies come in and, and they have blueprints for how they're, they're going to harass workers and scare them from from reporting an injury. And I work with people who get injured on the job that say they did it at home because they've already got discipline on their record. If they report an injury, they're fired. You know, and so we don't know about the hazards. If people aren't reporting the hazards out of fear of retaliation, then we don't actually know. So the whole concept that this is somehow <laughs> making the workplace safer because we're harassing people, you know, 
and it, it's, it doesn't even achieve its own goal. <laughs> like people are still dying, they're still getting injured. So in, you know, in, in a lot of ways, this whole, um, what we've been doing for decades, you know, and complying with this, and, and our unions are complying with it too, and saying, you know, oh, we're gonna get involved with, with this joint <laughs> relationship with management on safety. We all care so much about safety. And there is no joint <laughs> cooperation. It's it's always an antagonistic relationship. It doesn't have to be, but but that's what we've allowed it to become. Um, I think if people were felt safe to report hazards and safe to report injuries, and and we worked around fixing the hazards as opposed to disciplining people, um, it, we actually could have safer workplaces. And it's it baffles me that that we're not doing this, that we're not listening to people like Nancy Lesson and. In other parts of the world, you know, that, that have been studying, you know, a good, what a good safety program looks like. And um, again, that's, that all came into play. Nancy was an expert witness on my case and, and talked about, you know, the programs that actually work. So, it, the, the, you know, there's a lot of solutions and it shouldn't be one person fighting. You know, the, it, this is a collective problem and it's killing us. So why not do something about it? <laughs> and I mean, the state of workers, uh, in this country, are they being terrorized and intimidated into silence about serious issues in the workplace? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll take a case of um, a good friend of mine and, and many people. Sorry. Okay. And his name was Tom Kenny, and uh, Chris Lower was another victim of this accident. We had a crossing down in Longview, Washington, right next to the yard office, and. Uh, there was no crossing arms and the there was a double main 50 mile an hour and it was on a curve so you couldn't hear the trains coming so our because we don't have safety crossing guards at this location our mo to get out of the yard office was we would sit in the van look both ways <laughs> if we didn't hear anything we'd gun it you know we'd just go for it and hope for the best and and we had complained about this. There was near misses. Um, Union Pacific complained about it. Amtrak complained about this crossing for years. We actually had crossing gates that were resting behind the yard office that they didn't want to install because there was some conflict of should the county pay for it or should the company pay for it. So this problem went on and on until one day, um, Van pulled out of the yard office with my friend and uh, Christopher Lohr and um, two other people. and. The driver <laughs> and um, the train came, hit him 50 miles an hour. Um, three of them died, one of them lived. Um, and I think everything kind of changed for me on that day <laughs> in terms of um, of safety. That that you know, this isn't just something we talk about like in the periphery. I mean, this is this is what we have to do to protect ourselves so that we can go home every night. And the carriers talk about that too. You know, they, they use the same language, and yet it's always in a way that, that if only you <laughs> didn't act in this unsafe way. And in fact, like the next day when they came out with a, the safety briefing on the accident, which we'll get you know something about what they feel might have happened, and it was that there were the, you know, the crew might not have had a, a job safety briefing, you know, prior to getting in the van and discussing, you know who is going to stay awake and, and watch and, <laughs> and be like, you know, it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Why not just put in the crossing guards, which they did finally, but people had to die for that to happen. And it shouldn't be that way. If we turn in a safety violation that we think that has happened, or if, if we inform the company of a hazard, like I want to see that fixed right away. It's not, you know, and, and, and in fact, most of our safety numbers are based on like the, the projections that they would like. They would like to see only 3.2 people injured <laughs> next year. You know, these are our safety goals. We only want to see 3.2 people injured next year. We only want to have 20, you know, non-reportable injuries on the job. You know, these are our safety goals. And if we reach these goals, then management is going to get a bonus, right? I would like to see a plan that said, you know, here are the violations, <laughs> the, the hazards that we've identified as workers. So let's see how many days it takes the company to fix these hazards, um, which management, people in management actually proactively went and, and fixed these hazards. Like that's, that should be our goal. And it's, why are we not demanding that? I don't know. 
I don't know. And the union, what if the union was really taking up this issue, what could the unions do? All the railroad workers unions. Uh, oh, there's there's so many things that we can do. You know, we we have these these things. We're supposed to be our brother's keeper, right? We're supposed to to watch and and our fellow workers. And if they make any mistakes, you know, we're supposed to approach them and tell them that they're acting in an unsafe way, you know, and hopefully go to a manager and tell them that they're acting in an unsafe way. But why not do that with the management? <laughs> so we have these these forms that we can turn in that say, I observed this manager acting in this unsafe way. I reported this violation. He did not fix it immediately. Uh, you know, you know, there's so many things that we can do actually. <laughs> that um, I'm I'm working with Nancy and in, in figuring out what we can do because they've they've done this in other industries and it's worked. They had one, a lot of these incentive programs, right? So they have a. If you go so many days injury free, you get you know a jacket or you get a steak dinner or um, you know these these incentive programs, which actually work really well. Whether it's you know a jacket or a donut, like it, like people want the free stuff, and and in, in very subtle ways, you're you're kind of ostracized if you're the person that made it so they couldn't get all the jackets, right? So they had this one, uh, Nancy Lesson was talking about this, this one um, factory where uh, if the person who ruined it for everyone um, by turning in an injury form, um, he has to wear an orange jacket and, and, and walk around the job site in this, you know, the orange safety vest. So everyone knows who it was that took away their, their prize, right? So the union brilliantly came back and uh, bought orange vest for everyone <laughs> and put these buttons on it that said fix the hazards don't blame the workers and uh, they were all ready to do it the next day and and uh, I guess management found out about it and and came on and said hey we're not going to do this yeah we're, we decided to not do this program but, but there's so many things that we could do creatively that that can counteract these things but again it's it can't come from our international. It's not going to come from our international. It's going to come from us working together, you know, on safety committees that are union-based and not joint, you know, because this is stuff that we need to come up with to save our own lives and to save the lives of our fellow workers. And um, so that's that's the hope that I see in the future. And Railroad Workers United, you are a <clears throat> member of this organization. Why did you join this organization? And what is the idea of this organization? Um, I was a founding member um, before we were Railroad Workers United. We were um, ROCU, Railroad Operating Crafts United. Uh, we were trying to form a merger between the engineers and the conductors unions who have traditionally fought each other more than the carriers. Um, that ended up not happening because, you know, the one went with the Teamsters, one went with the sheep metal workers. So we decided to become a caucus of all of these various uh, crafts, not just operating crafts, but dispatchers, track workers, um, w Ratzenberger van drivers, the people that actually haul us to our trains, you know, we're all working together, but we don't talk to each other. And um, so it's, it's amazing that it's, <laughs> it's such a revolutionary idea for railroad workers to talk to each other, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's taken a long time to build our numbers, you know, to a point where, you know, we're able to mount an effective campaign, but we have a number of campaigns um, against behavior-based safety programs. We have uh, campaigns against one-man crews, against long and heavy trains. Um, so, you know, there's, we need more involvement from the rank and file, and, um, and uh, I've been a founding member, and unfortunately I haven't been very active lately because I've been in litigation, um, but, but uh, I hope to do a lot more in the future and, and, and build our numbers, and that's why we love coming to Labor Notes, because we get a lot of new members from here and new ideas about how we can fight these, these yeah. programs. Yeah. It's, it's an extremely effective tactic and the railroads figured out and not just here but but they're trying we had a, a brother from um from france and and their public railroad which all used to be under one collective bargaining agreement um since 1997 they've started splintering them right they're, they're taking it from the american way <laughs> and um and it is very effective if all of our our contracts are expiring at different times where's Where's the incentive? There's there's absolutely no pressure for anybody to get a good contract. And what generally happens is, you know, the, the carriers get together and they're united. <laughs> you know, they're all getting together and deciding what they want. And um, 
one year, the the engineers will get a great agreement and everyone else will suffer. And then the next year, the, the conductors will get a great agreement and then everyone else will, you know, and it just goes on and on. It just keeps pitting people against each other. You know, we're all so resentful of this great contract that they got. And um, I, <laughs> it's very effective. It's very effective. And, and, and we've actually, that's been one of our um, goals is to have all of our contracts expiring at the same time, you know, all of them coming to the negotiating table together as opposed to separately. You know, right now it's, you know, the engineers go to the table with all of the carriers and negotiate. Why aren't we all at the table with them? Are you for a master contract of all railroad workers in the United States? You know, States? I've, I've certainly been inspired by the, like the master freight agreement that they were able to get in the 30s uh, through the Teamsters. If you don't know about that, that whole history, it's fascinating how they were able to do it. And it was completely rank and file driven, um, getting a master freight agreement. I don't know if it's going to work. I mean, we're operating under agreements locally, and each railroad is like this, that have been in place for 100 years. But like I said, each of these are on a daily basis being either a challenge or outright ignored by the carriers. And, and then it has to go through the process of our union going to the general committee and then going to the international. And so as we're losing all of our rights, you know, it's going through this long laborious price process that really in the end we get nothing out of it. So yeah, I don't know the answer, but um, I is trust part, in my fellow workers. Is that part workers. of deregulation too of the railroads? Deregulation of the possibly, allowing, yeah. possibly, yeah. Um, <clears throat> allowing companies just to do what they want and divide <clears throat> up and. Yeah, I mean, sort of, sort of a pie in the sky um, idea that a lot of us have is to, to nationalize the railroads again, as they were briefly. Um, have for, public railroads as a public service. Right, but well, the railroad uh, owners wouldn't like that. Would they? Well, <laughs> and I'm not saying that it works either. It's not working so great with uh, Amtrak and 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 uh, one of the things that I was able to learn, you know, like a lot of our. Um, Amtrak agreements are actually being outsourced to France. <laughs> and so these, these, you know, parts of Oakland, um, I believe up in Massachusetts, um, they, it, it goes to the, the lowest bidder, basically. And Amtrak didn't have the low bid. And so this, these companies out of France have taken over these, uh, these lines that used to be public and um, making so a huge profit on it. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's coming, and, and they know it. And um, I think it's really important for us to to talk with Korean railroad workers, to talk with French railroad workers. I mean, we had someone from Brazil, and and uh, the subway drivers down there, they're, uh, they're completely empowered to go on strike down there. Um, we're not. We're, it's against the law for railroaders to strike, you know. Are workers here second-class citizens? It yeah, seems like workers in other countries have more rights. You know? uh, in some countries, yeah, that's, that's the truth. And it's, you know, completely flies in the face of what, you know, Americans think in terms of, you know, we're this wonderful developed country with all these rights that we enjoy. And I haven't found that to be the case. Now, there was a struggle in Longview with the Longshoremen um, where they were trying to break the union. Mm -hmm. Was there a solidarity between Longshoremen and railroad workers? Um, we, we are empowered to not cross picket lines. That, that is in our contract. And, um, and so we can stop the trains. Management comes out, and, and then they can cross the picket line. They take the train through the picket line. But, um, you know, there's not nearly enough solidarity with other unions um, in, in really what, what's the same transportation industry. Like, why aren't we talking to each other? Why aren't we talking to the Teamsters, the truck drivers, the longshoremen? That's, that's another um, pie in the sky <laughs> idea that I that I've had for a long time is like we should all be meeting together and building relationships with each other and that was something I learned in Seattle during the WTO protests you know which is what galvanized me and made me into an activist um, was was seeing you know that that we can do that you know it, it is possible to work with even for labor to work with environmentalists I mean that's a radical notion but but we all have the common enemy the same common enemy. Um, and that's big money. <laughs> Who doesn't care? They, you know, they treat worker like they treat the environment. So um, I'm really excited, and, and we're trying to do this in Seattle. Um, the people that are fighting, you know, the fossil fuels, whether it goes by trains, whether it goes underground, um, 
they're unfortunately not talking to labor who, you know, we're going through our own issues of working conditions, safety, um, and, and we should, of course, be talking together because the same people that are harming the environment are harming the workers, and we should be talking to each other. So that's, that's uh, one thing that I'm hopeful, now that all this litigation is over, that I can start <laughs> getting more involved in again. So these trains that they're going to carry the oil, mm -hmm. they want to heat the trains, and are they dangerous? Uh, the trains are exploding <laughs> on a regular basis, um, and one per car in particular, uh, and, and it's, it's something that needs to be taken out of the system. Um, we're putting a lot of pressure. We need to put a lot more. Our unions need to put a lot of pressure. In oil, and then it explodes. Right, right. It's not insulated enough to prevent, you know, and if you derail and there's, you know, anything, any spark that happens, um, the whole thing blows up, which is, we've seen happen on almost a weekly basis now. It's not necessarily in the news, you know, if people don't die, it's not in the news, but, but it is happening and um, it's a threat to us, it's a threat to the environment, to the communities that we're, we're running these trains, and it's completely unnecessary, completely. So where is the oversight? Do these companies control the regulatory agencies? Um, some might argue that. I, I can't really give an opinion on that myself. I, I've had a really good relationship with uh, the local uh, Federal Railroad Administration um, investigators. I think they do a great job. Um, on the national level, it's, you know, it's all political. <laughs> okay, so what should people do? What should railroad workers do who want, or others who want to get in touch with you? Or um, to get involved? Uh, you can go to Railroad Workers United, www.railroadworkersunited, and um, sign up. Join. It's fifty dollars a year, and it's true. We don't recommend. We we can't negotiate a contract for you, basically. But what we can do is is get you involved in these campaigns, and uh, unfortunately, it takes money. You know, we have to print stuff. We ha we have to do the newsletters. Um, we we'd love to have a full time organizer going around and and talking to individual terminals and finding out what the actual problems are, um, so that we can work together to to. To help each other and uh, so that's the main thing that I want to emphasize is we, we just we need to start talking to each other that's the first step I've been with the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen since they started taking trainmen um, which was 2009 I believe you know Supreme Court case that, that's like 10 years out of your life yeah 10 but at this point you know I bid it this far <laughs> and they haven't fired me yet they're trying to but um, but even if they do, I mean, the, I'm so passionate about this, you know, and having gone through this experience, I don't want anyone else to go through this experience. I don't want their families to have to suffer, as my family has had to suffer. So um, I'm going to keep talking.